This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, hello, hello. Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. And we're going to have a fantastic program today. It's probably the topic of the of the day, the century, the time, I don't know, other than Donald Trump, of course, but we have the infamous Simon Dixon, you know, he's the the leading proponent and expert and the first guy to ever speak about Bitcoin, you know, and he complimented me that he read my book. I should have read his book, but (laughs) so uh, his claim to fame is he is the Bitcoin um, way ahead of his time guy. And the date today is important because it's around January 12th. The reason why I say that is because things are changing so fast that if you, you don't have the reference of what, what data we're talking about, you know, you, ha- you, <laughs> you can get lost really quickly. So, uh, you know, Simon, I want to thank you because, because I listened to your, your work and all that. Being an old guy, I finally got into Bitcoin and um, we've done extremely well. So thank you very much on that. But I wish I had read your book earlier because I would have done even better. <laughs> anyway, here's Kim. Yes, well, welcome Simon. And, and Simon Dixon, just to, for everybody that, who maybe doesn't know him, he's the CEO and co-founder of banktothefuture.com and largest global online investment platform. Um, Robert, you've been studying Bitcoin excessively in the last year now. So this is gonna be a, this is gonna be a great show. Um, I have to say, Going into 2021, my my wish was that we have a peaceful and sane 2021, and obviously <laughs> that's not happening. <laughs> so, can't wait to get your take on all that's going on right now. And Simon might be the smartest guy on earth because he listened to Isle of Man, and then this morning on Fox, the FBI came out and says they're putting out warnings at every 50, every capital in America. They're putting warnings for rioting and all that. I'm going, holy mackerel. Anyway, with that, Simon, I'm just giving you a context of where we are on planet Earth and you're on Isle of Man. Very, very smart move. So welcome to the program. And let's start by giving a little bit of your background and how did you get to Bank of the Future and become the Bitcoin uh, guru? Yeah, sure, actually. A story you won't know, um, Robert, is that uh, I was working in investment banking um, and uh, I was going from market making to trading to corporate finance. Um, and somebody handed me a book in 2006 uh, called Rich Dad Poor Dad. Um, and uh, I really, it really related to the rat race. And uh, right after reading that book, I decided to quit my job and oh, return wow. to my passion um, and return to my passion of uh, economics. Um, and uh, I decided that uh, the business that I wanted to create, um, as well as being an investor, but I didn't have any money to invest. In fact, I was about even though I had a well-paid job, I was about a hundred thousand pounds in debt um, and uh, deep in the rat race and consuming rather than investing. Um, And uh, so in 2006, I decided to throw in the corporate towel and uh, I started trying, the business I tried to create was actually a non-fractional reserve bank uh, because I was really um, studying the fraud of money um, and how it's actually created. And so, um, that led to me to writing the book, Bank to the Future, Protect Your Future Before Governments Go Bust. Um, and that uh, led me to actually speaking at the very first Bitcoin conference in the world. Wow. Um, and uh, when, when I spoke there, um, I realized that the Bitcoin community was actually creating that infrastructure. So I bought my first Bitcoin at $3. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we started investing in all the companies. And um, so the Bitcoin did well. So we I was looking at the cash flow quadrant, reinvesting some of my assets. Oh, yeah. um, and uh, we started investing in companies like Coinbase and Kraken and Bitstamp and Bitfinex. Um, and many of those, about 10 of those have gone on to become the, the, the exchanges that built our industry. So um, we built banktothefuture.com to allow other people to co-invest in the stocks and shares of early stage Bitcoin companies. Um, and the rest is history. So. Uh, you've got a part to play in the in the story that you may not know about. Well, yes, I, yes. I am very, I'm honored, I'm honored, <laughs> I'm honored, and I um excited, I'm excited, excited for what you guys are doing. Quick question: What is your educational background? And are you English or you're? Yeah, oh. so I I, went, I did a master's in economics at university, but um, you Which, know, money was my subject really, um, and I started losing the game of money. 
as soon as I went into um, the rat race, as it were. Mm. Um, and so even though I was in the game of money, it was a really good education for me, learning how money moves, how the investment banking industry works. Um, but as soon as I'd learned what I needed to know, for me, it was really about um, getting on the right side of money because um, it, it, it wasn't working for me at the time. So, uh, yeah, uh, but I didn't do too well at, at university, uh, college. You know, I uh, had to go to a low-key university, um, but it was that economics and um, really getting out of university when I really started to learn economics that did it for me. Right. Yeah, it's funny <laughs> when, you get out of, when you get out of school, out of college, out of university is when the real learning starts. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's really surprising, Sam, that, you know, a lot of people who do well in university or, the, or you look at some of the some of the biggest and the brightest, like Clintons, Obamas, Bidens. You know, they don't. They have to go to politics. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Well, for me, I, I had to actually um, relearn economics. Yes. Um, because what I what I learned about money in economics was so detached from reality. Yes. Um, that I needed to completely relearn economics from Austrians, and because I was taught classical and Keynesian economics. Um, and, uh, you know, the assumptions around money was really that led me into this journey um, because the, how university teaches you about uh, how money is actually is created is, is so um, different to when you read great history books. I know you're a big fan of The Creature from Jekyll Island, um, you know, that reteaches you the history of how um, central banking actually was political um, and how it came to be and how wars were fought over trying to really uh, keep control of money. And eventually the banks ended up uh, taking over the whole digital currency system uh, because every time a bank issues a loan, when you take out uh, a loan with a bank, they're actually creating a digital currency. They invented digital currency. And Bitcoin found a way of doing that and circumventing the banking system, right. uh, which really captured my imagination early. Correct. You know, because, uh, you know, Kim and I have a home office and <clears throat> we don't, you know, I stay out of stocks and it's because I don't have control of it. You know, the CEO is a counterparty risk in that thing. I just don't. I worked for Xerox for a while and got a bad taste of corporate. And, you know, and I, and I should have bought Apple because I love, I love Steve Jobs and all this but I just want to stay away from them. And, and I don't know why, but it's, a, it's kind of a personal discipline. So yeah. I'm, in, I'm in gold, silver, and Bitcoin simply because exactly what you said, the banking system is based upon a fractional reserve system. And the average person out there has no idea what I just said. When you say that's true? Yeah, and even if you learn that it's based upon a fractional reserve system, it turns out that there's no fraction and no reserves. Um, <laughs> That's true. You know, the, the reality is, is that the you know it's not even uh, you know stocks are away. You have to you're pushed to stocks just to try and beat inflation. Right. Um, but the the bank deposits are just as risky. You know, there's counterparty risk in the bank deposits, and you're betting on the credit risk of the bank, and they're taking excessive risks. Um, and it's only the Federal Reserve and the, the, how the whole system's connected um, that, that keeps it. And it's not even insured. You, you think your deposits are insured. Um, only 1% of those is actually covered. Yeah. Anyway, it's, um, it's interesting how we, we come to our paths, you know, circuitously. We just keep going different places. But anyway, congrats, congratulations on all your success. Any comments, Kim? Yeah, so, so Simon, you know, going forward here, we're in a crazy, crazy time, and we haven't, I don't know where this is heading. Um, what, is your, what is your take on the banks with Bitcoin? or the, what, what do you see happening coming down the road? Yeah, so there's two types of banks at the moment. There's banks which uh, have sold off all of their toxic assets to your pension, um, <laughs> and the 401k is holding all of those toxic assets or the Federal Reserve is holding all those toxic assets. Um, and then there's banks I'm which... Uh, I'm essentially plugged my book because who stole my pension? Because you're saying exactly what I'm really concerned about. The old guys like me, they're going to find out there's nothing there. You know, there's just, yeah. it's just toxic assets sitting in there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the second type of bank is one that has excessive risk um, in... and. Um, I believe that the, the way that everything's moving right now is we've entered this two-tiered economy where you have a new superpower, China, um, which was built off a, a quasi-communist stroke capitalist um, experiment. 
And then you have America, which seems to be, if you look at the two, you've got America, which is looking more and more like China every day, and China that's looking more and more like America every day. Um, and eventually you converge in this socialist um, ideal. Um, and so when you look at politics right now, um, the IMF called out for Bretton Woods too. I know Kiyosaki, you always talk about, so Robert, um, the, you know, 1971, the rules of money changed, and that's exactly right. Um, but in 1944 was the precursor to 1971, um, uh, where this debt-based, backed by gold, but fractions of gold um, really started to be. Now, I think we're, we're mentoring into a new monetary phase. So for governments all around the world to pay for all of these obligations that they've made, that they seriously cannot meet, um, we have to move to a completely new monetary renegotiation. And so a Bretton Woods II style moment and I think that moment is going to be central bank digital currencies where they're going to be issuing uh, money based upon allowing banks to go bust. So insolvent banks, rather than bailing them out and rather than bailing them in, um, they're going to let them go bust. And it means that any money that you held at a bank, you can download an app in the future and you'll, end, you'll have this new central bank digital currency. Now, the problem is with that money is it's a deleveraging of the economy but that money is going to be surveillance. It's going to be removal of all your privacy, removal of all your freedoms. When you take that money, the helicopter money that's going to be issued and used to allow banks to go bust, we're taking out these intermediaries and banks and technology companies are all going to be built on top of these central bank digital currency. Um, and then you have Bitcoin, which is the exact opposite. So the money that you hold at a bank, you don't own it, but the bank is the legal owner. You can't spend it because of the surveillance and anti-money laundering laws and all sorts that uh, make innocent people not be able to spend their money. And it's being printed out of existence. Then you have Bitcoin on the other side. You can own your money. You can spend your money. And the money supply is completely fixed. So that's why it's a frenzy of companies right now trying to protect their balance sheets from the dollar and putting a percentage of it into Bitcoin because the writing's on the wall in terms of these trends. And I think we're in the mid, the, one of the largest wealth divides that we've ever seen um, with these you know, incredible wealth inequality that's causing people to really push for socialist ideals because everybody's deep in debt and the inequality has got crazy. And they're gonna push for that central bank digital currency, which is going to be signing away your freedoms, your personal liberties and privacy. The question everybody wants to know, you know, because it's, it's when, you know, when gold was, I was buying, I was buying gold at 35, you know, so quite happy, but everybody wants to know how high is it going to go? And I keep saying, it's not how high is it going to go? It says, how many ounces do you have? And when I, when I talk to people about Bitcoin, my answer is the same. It's how many Bitcoin do you have? Who cares about the price? Almost, you know what I mean? That's almost my attitude towards it. Because when you look at the macro, it's coming apart. That's, that's all yeah. I tell you. So what's, what can you trust out there? And that's why I thank you. Because, you know, like <clears throat> when I started listening to your stuff and a whole bunch of other guys like Pompliano and Ralph Hell. And then, of course, uh, not Peter Schiff, but Max Kaiser, <laughs> you know, they're having that war going on, those two guys. But yeah. it's, I don't know why people get so involved in the dollar amount, the price versus the quantity. That's how, and the reason I like Bitcoin is because of the having the, the supply goes down. So we have a lot of questions we want to ask you about that. But the question right now is that the price of Bitcoin went to like over 40. I think today is trading around 35 or something. What causes that fluctuation? That's the question I have. Yeah, so um, gold is what I call a store of value. And by store of value, it means it's not designed to increase your wealth. It's designed to preserve your wealth. For 5,000 years, it's preserved people's wealth. And so the, when the wealthy and the central banks use gold um, as a store of value. Whereas Bitcoin is a 10-year experiment, it's a speculative store of value. And that means that it has many of the properties of gold, but it's digital so that it can be used, the utility is greater in certain extremes. Um, but it's speculative because, you know, it's not got 5,000 years of history. So that means that the majority of the world, you know, I've seen my $30 Bitcoin crash to $3 in a day. 
I've seen my $1,250 Bitcoin crash to $250 in a couple of weeks. I've seen my $20,000 Bitcoin crash um, to $250 in less than a month. Um, the reason is, is because people are speculating on whether Bitcoin can become a store of value. Mm. Um, and so the, that means that some people, the vast majority of the world, still think that Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme, a scam, a currency just for drug dealers, um, or it's uh, you know, a get-rich-quick scheme. Um, but each year, more and more people realize that the value of gold, of, of Bitcoin, is owning your own money, spending your own money, and having a fixed supply. So over the years, all these new cases come along where people actually discover the latest case is really actually the people on a mass scale understanding about money printing and uh, you know, why people are asking questions on a simple level. Why am I paying tax if you can create trillions of dollars overnight in order to, you know, these questions people are asking and it leads them to things like Bitcoin because we're in the information age and information is readily accessible. So this speculation means that until the day comes where everybody knows that Bitcoin's not a scam, a Ponzi scheme, a currency just for drug dealers and a get rich quick scheme, it might act more like gold, but digital gold um, and therefore will be more of a wealth preserver than a wealth creator. Mm -hmm. So you have to have a, a thick skin and be willing to go through the ups and downs as the emotions of fear and greed cut in, as people get scared of, is it gonna fail? Is it gonna succeed? Correct. And we'll come back, we went to, uh, fantastic talking to you, and we'll come back, we'll have more questions for you. A lot of questions. A lot of questions <laughs> and things like this. And uh, I really appreciate that. So when we come back, we'll be more with Simon Dixon. His book is called Bank to the Future. He's a, uh, I think he's the number one guy that ever got onto Bitcoin. Even Max Kaiser acknowledges you, which is pretty good. Chef hates you too, but anyway, he's, <laughs> he's got my cars. <laughs> but, I, I like Chef, but, I, but his views on gold. <laughs> it's, 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 it's I think it's the debate. old guys versus the young it's guys. I think debate. that's what it comes down to. So anyway, we'll come right back with Simon Dixon. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. Today we have Simon Dixon, and he is the leading guru on Bitcoin. And it's a very important discussion, especially at this time of history. All hell's already broken loose, which is good for Bitcoin. But you can listen to the Rich Dad Radio program anytime, anywhere on iTunes, Android, and YouTube, if you don't get deal listed. And please, <laughs> we've, we've been hit several times, Simon. We don't say anything bad. We had Trump on, which was not the best thing, but we got nailed for him. I mean, what's going on? But anyway, listen to the, you can listen to this program. We archive everything at richdadradio.com because rep repetition is how we learn. Listen to this one more time. You'll hear what Simon is saying about Bitcoin. But more important, we have friends, family members, and business associates who know nothing. This is a good program to listen to. So with that, we'll welcome back Simon and um, you take it away, Kim? Yes, well, and Simon's also the author of Back, Bank to the Future, Protect Your Future Before Governments Go Bust. And the way things are going, <laughs> governments could be going bust any day now. Um, yes, yeah, so Simon, um, we were talking at the break and, and Robert, you were talking about the difference between um, trading and investing right. Bitcoin. Can you elaborate a little bit on that, Simon? Simon? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I've seen a lot over, over the years, having been from the beginning, I've seen people that were involved in the highest performing asset class in history that still didn't accumulate wealth. There's a couple of reasons for that. One, they spent their Bitcoin because they needed to meet their living expenses and they weren't spending their fiat money, they were spending their Bitcoin. Um, and so treating it as a median of exchange and unit of account rather than a store of value. Um, but the second is because they overtraded it. Um, and every time you trade, you create a taxable event um, and you also create the opportunity to be wrecked by insiders. So Bitcoin has every... Wrecked? What do you mean by wrecked? Uh, sorry, wrecked is a, is a crypto phrase where you lose all your money. Um, sorry, you, there's, there's so much jargon in our, in our industry. You know? <laughs> Hoddles and FOMOs and wrecks and all these funny phrases you see on Twitter. Nothing changes, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so over trading is a real killer. Um, and I've seen so many people that have tried to invest in the next Bitcoin killer and end up with no Bitcoin. Um, and it, it's, it's a very big mistake. And especially when new people join, they come along and they say, well, Bitcoin's $35,000. I could buy something else that's like a couple of cents and try and replicate the story. 
Um, and while there may be a time and a place to do that, but you don't want to get caught with no Bitcoin. So the difference between investing and trading is um, an investor really looks forward to the bull markets and the bear markets. Um, so for me, I really like it when Bitcoin cracks because it allows me to accumulate more Bitcoin at a lower rate. Um, I'm not going to be selling that Bitcoin. And if it crashes like crazy, I don't really care because I've got a long term perspective on it. Um, and I don't want, you know, and the, Bitcoin is a very manipulated market, just like every other market short term. Um, you know, you've got people with vast wealth, the hedge funds, the exchanges um, that push the price up and down like crazy. And they're just trying to scare you out of your Bitcoin. They're long term holders of Bitcoin um, and they're trying to get your Bitcoin. Um, and if you're a trader, you can be, you know, 90%. I worked in the traditional markets. I was a, I was a market maker. And 90% of traders lose money to the 10% of insiders. The same is true in Bitcoin, traditional markets, gold markets, everything. Everything. Um, so short term, you are trying to beat the, these people. And they know more than you. They've got access to better resources. So the great equalizer is becoming an investor. You know, traders, in, it's, it's a losing game. You're creating taxable events and you're trying to beat the insiders. Now, you might be great at that, but most people aren't. Yeah, what Simon is talking about is a taxable event, like, because Kim and I make most of our money in real estate and in business. And we save our money in gold, silver, Bitcoin, because we don't trust the dollar. And uh, these people come in and they're flipping real estate. And it didn't make any sense to me because you buy, let's say you buy it for 10,000, you sell it for 100,000, you have a taxable event. You know, plus you put all that money at risk. You know, it doesn't make sense to me. So we're, I think Kim and I, we're, we're long-term on everything. Everything, right? yeah, everything. Well, you look, you look at real estate. I mean, it takes a lot of time to find a great property. So yeah. once we find it, we want to hang on to it. Um, but flippers have a, just a whole different mentality. The same, the, the same as Bitcoin, very expensive. we're never going to sell it. But I, mm. I just get, my teeth get soft when I see the price going down and, you know, I want to jump in and buy as much as I can where other people are panicking. They're selling because it's going down. I mean, that's kind of a different mindset, isn't it, Simon? Mm. Yeah. So this is the whole, um, you know, currency versus money debate. And when I first read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, that aha moment of accumulating assets. So Currency is what the governments create and it always dilutes and it always goes down in value and every single fiat currency in history eventually goes to zero and fails. Um, money stands the test of time. And as I said, you know, Bitcoin um, is a speculative money, um, but it's based, upon, it's based upon the principles. Um, so when someone says to me, are you selling um, Bitcoin? I hear, I, am I buying currency? Um, you know, and oh, why would I buy currency? Right. Well, the reason I buy currency is if I need to meet my short term living expenses um, and I don't mind, you know, currency is very good for that. The stuff the government creates is very short term for meeting your mortgage obligations or your living expenses, but it's useless for savings. And so if someone says to me, you know, sell Bitcoin, I'm like, well, I'd have to buy some currency and wh why am I going to hold currency? Right. Right. So I don't know if you can hear what Simon is saying is that our partner, Ken McElroy, who we were in real estate together, the biggest liability we have is cash today. And what we're in real estate, what we're attempting to do is take cash, U.S. dollars or whatever it is, and convert it to debt. And then the debt is inside an asset called an apartment house. And, and that's how we think. But everybody wants to save cash. We're trying to get out of it. You know, the average person is trying to get into it. But before we go on, let's, let's go into this up and down and all this stuff because, you know, when Bitcoin was up at 41,000, you know, the first thing I say, I should have bought more. And then it drops down to like 30,000. I said, I'm going to buy more. Yeah. I have no patience. You know, I just, you know, I just want more and more and more of it, but I'm never going to sell the damn thing. So what, you know, Kaiser was talking about, what, 150,000 or $225,000 an ounce or something, or per coin. Do you ever do stuff like that? Speculate on what the future price might be? Um, so, no, for me, I've avoided, um, I've avoided it because actually, even when I'm trying to be conservative with price forecast, Bitcoin has usually beaten it over the years. So it's been the highest performing asset for 10 of the last 12 years. Um, and every, you know, you, you're, not, you're not alone. The emotion of investing into Bitcoin, 
ever since I've been involved, everyone has always thought I've missed the boat, the price is too high, it can't go any further. Um, and that's been the same. Everybody celebrated when they sold it at a dollar. Everybody celebrated when they sold it at $10, $100, $1,000, $10,000. And I do expect people to be celebrating when they sell it for $100,000. You know, we can't give financial advice, but to me, it's supply and demand, economics 101. And um, the supply of Bitcoin is there's only ever going to be 21 million. Um, 18 and a half million have already been created. Probably four to six million of them have just lost because in the beginning, people didn't know that they needed to value them um, in the early days. And so now you've got, you know, it was originally in individuals realizing that they need it. Now Wall Street and corporations are starting to realize that they need it. And next, central banks are going to realize that they need it and governments are going to realize they need it. And so this is the only asset class in history where it went backwards. The individual got in first, the corporation got in second, and the government gets in last. Normally, it's the complete opposite. Wall Street first working crony capitalism with the government, and then they're doing IPOs and selling it to you for your pension. Um, mm. This is the first time it's gone backwards, which created um, such an interesting time in financial history and such a wealth transfer from this group of geeks and you know, uh, missionaries that just wanted to take on the banks that turned into what it is today. And it's been, you know, I, I never imagined that Bitcoin would succeed in the early days. I really didn't. It was just something that had to succeed. So I started investing and, 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 uh, and investing in the infrastructure. Um, but Bitcoin has just become this force. Um, and, uh, you know, whatever, whatever the market throws at it, it seems to recover. But you've got to, be able, you've got to, be, you've got to have a long-term perspective because short-term, you're not going to enjoy the ride at all. So, yeah. so other than the emotional um, roller coaster that sometimes goes along with Bitcoin, is there a, is there a downside to Bitcoin? Um, yeah, so there is a downside to Bitcoin. You need to, with the responsibility of owning your own money comes the responsibility of securing your own money, which is a big pain in the ass. One of the problems with owning gold is that you um, normally end up storing it in Switzerland or Singapore because putting it in your house is either very inconvenient or unsafe. Um, now, you need to learn a new skill. And the good thing is, is that this is a skill for the future that everybody needs to learn. The future is about cyber attacks and everybody trying to steal your data, steal your money, steal your emails, hack into your accounts. And the, by learning how to secure your Bitcoin, it's, um, there's, you know, when we first started, when we first got involved, that was a very hard task. Entrepreneurs have created amazing tools and amazing technology uh, to make that a lot simpler nowadays. Um, but it's still a new skill that people need to learn. But as I said, you know, when you have money on the line and your savings on the line, it's a pretty good motivator to learn how to protect your personal, be personally sovereign. Um, and that is the same skill everyone needs to learn in the future because we are in a cyber terrorist environment in the future. Everybody needs to learn how to protect their data. That's a good point. Well, a quick, quick question because we're running out of time here. What is to prevent somebody else from starting their own Bitcoin? Um, well, 10,500 other people have tried to create their own Bitcoin and no one has quite ever replicated the network effect for a few reasons. Bitcoin was created at a time when nobody cared and nobody was pricing it and nobody was speculating on it. And so it had this time frame where somebody, somebody created it that nobody knew who it was. And the fact that no one could go to the central bank and say, oh, Bitcoin has, uh, I've stolen my money, can you compensate me? With Ethereum, with everything else that's been created since, there's always a central figure that is connected to it. And so there's always someone that can change the code, manipulate something, because Bitcoin is now the world's largest supercomputer that is secured by tens of thousands of computers all around the world with no creator, which gives it commodity-like features that nothing else has ever been able to replicate. Um, and so therefore, Bitcoin has its unique space at our world's best shot at ever achieving digital hard money and no other cryptocurrency. They can copy the code, but they can't copy the network effect um, and have an anonymous creator and the security behind it has never been replicated. And so this is, this is what I wrote, I wrote about in this book called Fake, Fake Money, Fake Teachers, Fake Assets. 
And I called gold because I'm a gold and silver guy. I started my own gold mine and silver mine. And gold and silver are God's money. They're, they're elements on a periodic table. I mean, they've been here, this earth was formed. And I say, Bitcoin is people's money. And by people's money, it's the network of the people. That's what you're saying, isn't it? The people. I love that. It's, 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 Bitcoin is, is, is freedom. It's the ability to own your own money, spend your own money, and but not be at the mercy of anyone else's money supply. Right, no, but the network is the people who Absolutely. watch over it. It's not a central system, it's a people system. Exactly, it's secured by mass and code, and that is the people, only the people decide whether that mass and code change, and it's very hard to change because you won't get consensus on the change. So when some people say, well, what, what gives Bitcoin is, why can't I just, you and I just start one? You don't have millions of people watching you or already, it's, it's like having a Ford dealership. You, know, you, you can produce Ford cars, but the dealerships sell them. So you have all these dealerships, that's the network. And that's mm -hmm. what's hard for people to understand. It's not just about writing code. It's the people who are watching it with their little computers they're watching what you're doing, something you cannot do with Janet Yellen or this other character who's in the Fed right now. They do what they want to do. They don't have to tell you a thing. That's, that's why I stay away from the dollar. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, the, the network effects and the security behind it, um, the decentralization, the fact that it's not been, um, it doesn't have a central authority that you can turn to to change things, to shut down, to send into prison. And if it did, it would have got shut down a long time ago, right at the beginning, but they didn't have any door to knock on. And that's exactly what, how it got here um, today. So Simon, um, I just want to back, go back to the uh, comment you made because one of the arguments I hear all the time is, oh, well, um, I'm not going to buy Bitcoin because my friend got hacked or my other friend lost their money. <laughs> so in your book, Bank to the Future, do you talk about how to secure your Bitcoin or where does somebody start to understand and learn about that? Okay, so yeah, uh, Bank to the Future is actually a 10-year-old a ten book. It was the world's first book published that included Bitcoin. Um, and just, I, I actually went back to reread it. There was a few things I got wrong, like privacy. Um, but I did forecast the Great Depression of the 2020s in the book. And I published a video on YouTube for that. Um, so it doesn't go deep into that. But uh, more recently, I created a video series um, on, uh, on a four-part video series on everything one needs to know to build a pension around it. You're absolutely right. You should be concerned about hacking, but not hacking of the Bitcoin network. It's the most secure network in the world. It's that you need to learn how to store it. And there is lots of solutions today that never existed in the past. So those stories you hear about are from people that have not been implementing it correctly. So um, yeah, I created a four part video series on that and that's free for everyone um, on the domain underneath my name. So Simon, well, thank you very much for sharing your wisdom and your brilliance and uh, you know, keep sharing. And that's the best, best way we make the world a better place. So thank you for sharing your wisdom. Yes, thank you. I learned a lot today and, and we're going to be talking. <laughs> thank awesome. Thank you so much for having me and writing that book because uh, that was a historical moment uh, that, that drove me to Bitcoin. So thank oh, you no, for all you do. I'll take complete credit for that. No, I, I just, <laughs> no, I just love it, you know, because I meet young, young people, guys like you and women, you know, and they're so different than my generation, our generation. So anyway, I really thank you and keep sharing what you know. We come back with one of the final comments from Kim and I on what Simon just talked about, but especially the idea of gold, silver, and Bitcoin. We'll be right back. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Pacheco Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. I want to thank Simon Dixon and his, his wisdom on Bitcoin and his book, Bank to the Future. It's a fascinating subject, fascinating time. Any comments there, Kim? Well, I learned a lot about, I learned a lot right now. And of course, we always have these guests on and they talk about gold and silver. And now Bitcoin is like, if we, fig we finish the show and I'm like, okay, we need to buy more Bitcoin. Okay, <laughs> so I'm, I'm now been somewhat converted. Thank you, because you've been <laughs> talking about this for a while. So it's good to understand it more. And uh, I will, I'm going to be talking to Simon a little bit more and learn more about this. Yeah, I have a new book coming out about this. He wants to write a book together, but I'm, I'm, I've been... I just don't trust my government. I hate to tell you that, but I don't trust them. So I don't trust the dollar. I don't trust Wall Street, you know? 
I don't know who else don't I trust well, out there? Well, that's why I like gold, silver, Bitcoin, because I can trust it. Yeah. And that's, that's all it is. I don't like stocks because, you know, Kim and I took two companies public, and three companies public. And when you see how stocks are manipulated, you go, oh my God, this is criminal what they're doing. But exactly as Simon says, that one or 2% rips everybody off. And if you don't, you can't control your own money. Why are you saving the dollar or the yen or the euro or the peso, right? Yeah, and the one key point for me that Simon said, he said that the central banks will create this digital currency and you're going to trade your fiat currency for this digital currency. And in doing so, these were the magic words for me, you will have to sign away your privacy and your freedoms. And when he said that, because I fight hard for my privacy and my freedoms, and if this is another way that the governments can take more away, then that was a big turning point for me. Right, it's the same as a vaccine. I, I think it's just yeah. a control mechanism. I think so too. You know, if, if you don't have a vaccine, you can't get on a plane, you can't go to the toilet or whatever, you can't do anymore. So that, that's why I'm, I've, ever since I came back from Vietnam, I stopped trusting my government. And that's, I hate to say that, but you know, I've stayed out of politics. I've been politically neutral until my friend Donald Trump ran for president, unfortunately. And he's still a great guy in my book. And what's going on, he's being attacked by social media. I think that is horrifying, absolutely horrifying. I think it's absolutely horrifying that they can take you off the air for, if they disagree with you. Oh my God, what happened to the First Amendment? So that's kind of the stuff that I'm concerned about now but I'm more dedicated to being a, what a sovereign individual, an independent person with gold, silver, and Bitcoin, and we can run any way we want to run if we have to, as long as I get vaccinated first, if we can get on the stupid plane. And the King West say, Kim? <laughs> It just inspires me to make more money so we can have our own plane. <laughs> I don't have to deal with these vaccines. <laughs> oh, good idea. Oh, I kind of like that idea. But anyway, I want to thank Simon Dixon, because I, I listen to him all the time, you know? He is a character of characters. Every time I listen to him, he has some, he has, I guess cause it's, it's kind of an English wit to him. It's a little sarcastic, but it's funny. You know, it's cutting and it's, it's to the point. So I want to thank Simon Dixon. I want to thank all of you listening to the Rich Dad Radio Show. And keep an open mind because you're going to need one this time. The 2021, as Simon said, is going to be worse than 2020. Thank you for listening Stay to the Rich Dad Radio Show. <laughs>